she walks into the kitchen, pulling the hoover behind her. It's time for her medicine and a cup of herbal tea. Oh, how she would love a strong cup of coffee. But that really wouldn't be a good idea at the moment. She hasn't eaten anything yet. She has to eat something. No time to cook right now. There's still a slice of pizza in the fridge from yesterday. If she ate that, then at least she'd have something in her stomach. Surely a small piece wouldn't do any harm. She eats the cold slice of pizza while she waits for the water to boil for her tea. It tastes awful. She really must be ill. She doesn't even like pizza anymore. Maybe she should have heated it up. But a little piece like that? It isn't worth the trouble. The water is boiling. She could take a shower and get ready to go out while the tea's brewing. Oh, but there's the shopping list. Shopping. Food for dinner. A Christmas gift for her husband. Flowers for mother's grave. Oh, God, if only it was already done. She remembers the tea. Oh, dear. It shouldn't have been left to stand for so long. It tastes bitter. She forces herself. She's not fussy. She can stomach a lot. As she struggles to swallow the bitter brew, she leafs through the paper which is still lying on the table. Lost in thought, she starts to read the appalling report of the dramatic death of a Japanese woman. It happened quite close by in a neighboring suburb, and as she reads, the images of the tragic story rise out of the paper run like a film between the lines and reveal what really happened. In a series of pictures, the dead woman's years of torment flash before her eyes, her German husband having an affair, she herself suffering more and more until out of sheer despair the poor woman succumbs to the advances of an admirer. This romance only lasted a couple of weeks because... Just as she had decided to leave her husband, he appeared on bended knee full of remorse and won her back within seconds. How sweet their reunion must have been. But the illusion only lasted for a brief moment. For a few short hours their love hung on a silver thread, but the thread finally broke. Poor wretched woman. Life wasn't going to be easy for her from now on. That would be too much to expect. The husband, humiliated to the very core of his conceited masculine pride, was unable to forgive her what she had had to put up with for so many years. He set up special rules. He may. She may not. Nothing. He was the boss. A patriarch of the old school. Or was he simply an asshole? And now, clearly for all the world to see, her posture changes. She begins to stoop under the weight of her heavy burden. Hour upon exhausting hour, she has been forced to justify herself, tried with all her might to explain to this jealous husband. Yes, even sworn that she loves only him and would only leave out of desperation but now, if he doesn't let up soon, it will become totally unbearable. She shouldn't have said that. It would be her downfall. Her intuition tells her so. Whenever she told the truth, he punished her for it. She learned the hard way that he didn't want to know. The bruises all over her delicate body warned her and whispered in solidarity, be quiet, or he'll kill you. And so at the last moment she always disguised the truth, stammered loving words of devotion and obedience under his hand. She reconciled herself with perversion and submitted to the sick rules of play, just in order not to die. Why didn't she make the choice to live and leave this monster? 
but that isn't so easy to do. And so this little Japanese woman sits with her husband at the kitchen table over supper for the last time. They talk about day-to-day -day things. He doesn't say much. He looks tired. At a first glance, she looks almost cheerful. But if you look again, you can see that really she's sad. Very, very sad. All at once, the bloodshot eye which she has carefully disguised with makeup becomes visible. And under her skirt, you can see an enormous dark bruise. And there, on her arm, another one. How awful. She clears the table in silence, submissive. She seems to have lost her will. She is grateful for the quiet, which has become so rare. He has left the table and is now sitting in the armchair over there, reading the paper, belching loudly. After all, he is alone in the living room. No one can hear him, except his wife, maybe. But she's clattering dishes. And anyway, they're married, aren't they? Time for a nap in front of the TV. The monotonous murmur of the news and the political reports make one drowsy. In brief waking moments, he switches through the programs in search of another channel. It's not easy to find something worth watching. Nothing on TV again. He ends up with an ancient western which he's already seen a hundred times. He can't quite remember the story. Must have been pretty stupid, the usual rubbish. There are only a few good westerns, and he's seen all of them, of course. They don't interest his wife particularly. She'll watch anything. Nothing is too stupid for her. Just doesn't like to switch over but she stopped complaining when he does. Well, that's how it should be. He dozes on, the remote control still in his hand. It goes on like that for a while. He wakes up, glances at the TV, switches over, looks, and dozes off again. Until it suddenly occurs to him that his wife isn't sitting in the armchair next to him where she always sits after she's cleared up in the kitchen. He wonders what she's up to. Behind his back. He can get a beer from the fridge and take a look. She's on the phone. She seems to be speaking deliberately quietly. What's she got to hide? Just as he comes in, as if by coincidence, she terminates the phone call and hangs up. He finds her behavior very suspicious and immediately starts questioning her. She reacts nervously. Stutters that she was speaking to a girlfriend who she met shopping and whose children she had offered to look after the next day. What? That was the first he'd heard of it. Was there something she was trying to conceal? No, no, nothing, of course not. She just didn't want to bother him with such trivialities. He is sure he can smell a rat. Starts getting worked up. She's probably been showing off to her girlfriend with her black eye and running him down, he accuses her directly. Oh, good Lord, no, she assures him, trembling slightly, for she recognizes that special look in his eyes, which tells her, there's no stopping him now. And how come she's got time to look after other people's kids anyway, he wants to know, and comes threateningly close. She can smell the danger. She must be careful what she says now. From now on, anything she says could backfire and be used against her. Well, have you lost your tongue? Come on, answer me. He is already seething. Oh, God help me, she whispers under her breath and hurries to say something. She's taken a couple of days sick leave, she begins in a subdued voice, as if she had no right to do such a thing. The storm breaks in all its fury. Ha! Now she is flaunting her married life around at the conservatory. 
Now everyone will know that her husband beats her and they will all pity her. Washing your dirty linen in public, what? Foam appears round his mouth. He gives her a first warning blow. She falls to the ground because she wasn't expecting it yet. She screams, but her voice is already hoarse. She says she has told her boss that she is not feeling well and that she's already been to the doctor because... This really drives him wild. He doesn't let her finish. So, now even the doctor knows all about your terrible husband. She can't tell him that the doctor never noticed the bruises. Even if she swore that she had only told the doctor that she had fallen off her bike and so on, it wouldn't be any use. It would never end. He gives her hell practically every day. She would have to endure these crushing scenes against which she was defenceless for the rest of her life. Or should she leave and start again from the beginning, alone, penniless, without a man at her side? She had no energy left, only just enough to die. She gave up. It felt good to know she was finally free. No more hypocrisy. No more apologetic bootlicking. No more of this sickening humiliation. No more begging for this little bit of a dog's life. She would never again beg him just to let her live. Never again. From now on, he can do with her what he wants. In her mind, she has already bidden farewell to this monster and to her very life. But before she finally takes her leave, she will sling all her anger and hatred at him, in his face. She will tell him what a miserable creature he is and let him know that she has lied to him all along and that meanwhile the whole world knows how he treats her and despises him for his shabby, primitive character. She can't prevent him beating her half to death. Hasn't enough strength to hit back. She is simply the weaker of the two. But she can spit in his face and with her last breath she can scream the shameful truth contemptuously at the top of her voice so that all the neighbours will hear. There is nothing to prevent her saying everything she thinks of him, of this nasty licentious, uncontrolled little bastard. To think that a big, strong man needs to beat a weak little woman. Those are the biggest cowards, she pants out, gasping for breath, blood streaming from her mouth. She loses consciousness, sinks to the floor, and can't say anything more. As if ridden by the devil, he tramples all over her because she's pretending to be dead. He'll knock these childish whims, as he calls them, out of her. You bet. She's a brilliant actress, that's what, and proud of it too. An excruciating pain forces her back to consciousness. She groans. Her intestines feel as though they are being torn apart. It's unbearable. For one precious moment she is again blessed with oblivion. When will I finally be dead? She comes round again because she is spitting blood. She heaves wretchedly. She coughs. Hasn't the strength to cough. She has to throw up and vomits a whole supper mixed with blood all over herself and over the floor. She can no longer see where it's going. Her eyes are so swollen. She feels the warm mass on her skin, which is burning from the blows. It'll soon be over. It can't be much longer now. Then she will have made it. The filthy mess she is making enrages him even more. She is just trying to provoke him. 
But this performance won't do her any good. It'll only make things worse. There. He lashes out at her again and again and smashes the half-empty beer bottle over her head. But she no longer feels it. She always has to make fun of him. Everyone always has to make fun of him. They seem to think that's what he's there for. Well, he's not going to put up with it any longer. There's a bottle of whiskey on the dresser. He grabs it, takes a large sip to give him courage, and comes back. His courage has never failed him. Oh, no, you don't, he spits out contemptuously. Not with me. He'll show her, he roars again for the hundredth time as he raises the bottle to his lips again. The disgusting little heap of misery at his feet stirs, begins to move and drags itself cumbersly on all fours in the direction of the bedroom. Continuously kicking and shoving, he helps the battered body forward with his feet until she reaches the bed. He spits on her with satisfaction. Let her die, the bitch. Then there'll be peace and quiet. And he returns to the kitchen and his whiskey which he sweeks down gulp by gulp in his anger. Whatever it was that made him so angry slips his mind. The alcohol drowns the hate and lulls him into a deep sleep until the break of day when he is awakened by a strange sound. He is surprised to find himself not in bed. He is still dressed and sitting on a chair in the kitchen. There is a terrible stink he sees the sticky mess, the remains of the previous evening. From the bedroom comes a throaty, strangled sound as though someone is suffocating. The sudden return of his memory sobers him in a second. A hitherto unknown sense of foreboding sends him running to the bedroom, which he finds in a terrible state of devastation. In a flash, he realizes the full extent of yesterday's clash. His wife is lying motionless, but she is still breathing, and she's trying to say something. He grasps that the situation really is serious. She is not play-acting. He can hardly understand what she's whispering. I can't breathe. No air, she rasps out and moans in pain. A doctor. He rushes to the phone like a hunted animal, Dial's emergency, a doctor, an ambulance, he calls in a daze. It can't be real. It's only a dream. Through numbed senses, he can clearly observe each of his actions. Everything seems unrelated to himself. He is confused. Time stands still, somewhere between the moment and forever. He sees everything, understands nothing. A doctor appears out of nowhere. Like a robot, he shows him to the bedroom where his wife is lying. But she no longer wanted to wait. <laughs>